ES Audio. Some of the best known brands in the world may seem like they've always been there, but even those names that appear traditional now were once disruptors. I was talking about Johnny Walker creating blended whiskey. Mm. He also created a square bottle because it was easier to transport. You know, it was he was disrupting himself and he was disrupting the market. Katerina von Frank is an SVP at Diageo and sits on the UK board of the company that owns Johnny Walker, Guinness, Smirnoff, Bailey's, the list goes on. And as channel growth director, it's her job to make sure those brands don't just survive, but thrive. And that means constant innovation, sometimes in spaces where history matters. It's important to, again, you know, obviously to have the consumer at the heart, but then also to look at your heritage and to look at what inspired you and, and your mission and your purpose and, 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 and try to, to, to move that along, you know, in, in a purposeful way. I'm David Marson from the Evening Standard and Diageo itself is going through some changes in the UK. They've just opened a new office in London's Soho, right at the heart of the capital's hospitality industry. It should have happened last year, but pandemic. And it's in that new HQ that we're meeting Katerina. How exciting is it to step into a new building like this, a new HQ for Diageo? So it's obviously incredibly exciting. And I just, you know, cast my mind back to a month ago and it felt like I've been with the company for 10 years. It felt like starting school on my first day, packing my bag and, you know, just thinking about what I needed to to take. But then also we're in Great Marlborough Street, just opposite Carnaby in the heart of Soho, just walking towards our office and seeing the hospitality industry. And I remember there were some kegs of Guinness being delivered, <laughs> somebody else is getting their condiment trays ready you know for the day and I think it's so exciting after you know the two very difficult years that we've had getting ready thriving again for us it obviously also means a huge investment into London Mm -hmm. Uh, it's one of the two investments that we're making throughout this year and next year we've also got our uh, Guinness Old Brewers Yard, the micro uh, brewery, uh, which is opening in o- the autumn of next year. So that's a huge 73 million pound investment that we're, that we're investing into London. And it's really recognising, I think, London as the hub of hospitality and pooling our four offices uh, that we previously had around London in, in into one hub um, at the centre of hospitality, essentially. Yeah, that's a lot of money going into the capital. Why? Why London? Throughout my career, you know, my, my life, I've actually lived in quite a few large cities, um, you know, New York being one, Copenhagen, uh, and also Milan. And, and I just find London is really one of the, if not the centre and heart of soul of hospitality. So if you look at, for example, the world's 50 best bars, which is an award that's given it's like the Oscars essentially for um, you know for for hospitality uh, which is given to the world's leading bars London is you know always represented there with some of the key bars there um, often taking the first spot so I encourage everybody who hasn't been you know to go to one of those bars it truly is an amazing experience Uh, There's obviously also London Cocktail Week. So, you know, at at the very top end, but also even at the, you know, at the um, at the mid tier, I find London really leading from a trend perspective. We're not afraid to disrupt uh, in in the industry. So, um, you know, and us obviously as a leader in beverage alcohol, I think it's only natural for us to then be at, at, at the heart of that. Hospitality is so important to London. You talked about coming to work and seeing the the hospitality industry setting itself up for the day. We see the people going into bars. We see the people sitting outside in restaurants. During that pandemic, we lost all of that. And the industry went through a terrible, terrible time. What was Diageo doing at that point? So it's, it's an incredibly interesting time and also a really tough time to look back on and I was really reflecting uh, on it actually there was a there was an industry awards show about um, just over a month ago called the publican awards which had you know the entirety of the of the hospitality industry in one room probably I'm probably doing the numbers injustice but around 100 and, uh, around a thousand and five hundred people were together in a room of the hospitality industry and I was just looking at that room 
and thinking about the resilience that every single person sat in that room demonstrated over the last two years. Uh, the, you know, opening, shutting, um, creating, you know, dark kitchens when you needed to, uh, creating outdoor spaces in, you know, your, uh, you know, in, in your in your pub's parking area, um, you know, really showing flexibility um, and, and showing real resilience in the, in, you know, in, in the face of a very, very difficult uh, time for the industry to manage. So seeing those people in the room who were probably fearful for their own jobs, their team's jobs, all together celebrating hospitality was absolutely amazing. So it's obviously a key part of what we do. Um, we want the hospitality industry you know, who are actually employing 2 million people uh, in GB to, to, to thrive. So we've put our support forward in, you know, a, a plethora of ways, actually. There's been firstly a fund, a Raising the Bar fund, where we pledged £30 million pounds to the industry to, to essentially support them. And I think just looking at how that fund was distributed is very much um a hallmark for how we needed to flex in the pandemic. I remember very much when we created, when we first created the fund, we thought, right, what can we do to, you know, what can we do to help these people? Right, they need PPE, they need, you know, hand sanitizing stations. So that's what we spent, you know, the, the first, uh, the first uh, in, yeah. instalment on. Um, then, you know, when it was all about outside, uh, outside hospitality, you know, we created snugs, we created parasols just for people to, you know, create their own outside spaces and their outside pubs where previously no spaces existed. Um, and now we've got a 2.5 million investment actually going into outside sports spaces for venues who, you know, who haven't had the equipment or the space to, to, to be able to, to show that before. So that's what we're doing now. So the second thing that we're doing is we're creating a hub in the Guinness Microbrewery, which uh, we are launching in Covent Garden next year. Uh, and it's going to be our Learning for Life hub. What we do there is essentially we look at uh, some people who may need some help uh, in training in terms of their employability in the hospitality sector, and we train them. And uh, we're looking to actually train 100 people a year with this program and there, there are some really heartwarming stories I uh, you know there, there's one that really touched me as a mum of a lady called Holly who actually went through this training and she was you know a very young mum she was 15 when she discovered that she was pregnant and um, had her you know had her little daughter um, when she was 15 was uh, in a in a mother and baby ward for, for for a while until then you know she was she was effectively you know put back out there in in, in the world you know as a 16 year old with a small baby and really no route to take from uh, from an employment perspective so we helped her we trained her she's done incredibly well uh, on the back of that turning her internship into you know a sustained employment and i believe she's now a team leader in the grand connaught rooms which is absolutely amazing so she's not just getting by she's thriving and you know as a mother of two daughters myself i think it's just she's setting a brilliant brilliant example for uh for for her daughter as well yeah i think what's what's really interesting about how companies got through the pandemic particularly in the hospitality industry is the level of grit demonstrated by people like holly but also in those pubs and those restaurants and the bars where there's maybe you know five ten people working there diageo is obviously enormous it can pretty much just brace itself and get through something like that but those places were some of them that, that, that did get through would have been two or three weeks away from closing down did you feel i guess a responsibility more than just a commercial reality or an actual responsibility to help those people out absolutely absolutely and i think that continues now uh, in some of the things that we're doing so for example we're creating jobs in um our microbrewery yeah. and we're creating 150 jobs there uh, but even at the time, we're all in this together. And I think there was a real feeling of, you know, we've we've got to get through this as a sector. We've got to get through this as an industry. And we've got to, you know, we, we believe in the fact that the great British public would like um, to connect, you know, to have those moments of interaction uh, in in a pub or in a restaurant in, in, in hospitality. But we've got to get through it together. So it was, it was, it was really a matter of, 
definitely responsibility and doing our bit, um, I think, in that. But, um, you know, as you say, I think we still feel that responsibility and it may, may take a slightly different shape now. So, for example, we have a huge uh, inclusion and diversity agenda at the moment. So we're looking to uh, 2030 and we've mapped out really clearly where we want to take the business and what kind of influence we want to have on society. Uh, also in terms of inclusion and diversity, and I say that also as, you know, a woman in a very male dominated industry, we're looking to to you know, obviously at ourselves, but also at our business partners, both at our customers, the agencies uh, we work with, you know, to help, um, just to help further diversity of thought. You're a bit of a brand expert, so I can't really have a conversation with you without talking about how to how to grow a brand. When you're thinking about maybe smaller companies just starting up, what kind of, I guess, what kind of mistakes do people make when they're trying to grow a brand? What sort of things should they be avoiding as well as getting the name out there? So I think we talk a lot about standing on the shoulders of giants. So if you're, ma- if you're mentioning those brands like Guinness, for example, absolute powerhouse of a brand, Johnny Walker, absolute powerhouse, you know, and we've got, we've, we've got so many with Smirnoff, Bailey's, you know, Tanqueray. Um, so I think there's, you know, a real respect that we try to demonstrate as temporary custodians of of these brands and recognizing the heritage and where they've come from. And there's actually an element of, I think, creativity and also disruption in each of these brands and how they were created. So for example, you know, if I look at Arthur Guinness, for example, he was making stout at a time where every, everybody else was making, you know, pale, uh, pale beer. He made, you know, a really full flavored, uh, strong and dark one. Johnny Walker, for example, he created, you know, his first, um, you know, his, his essentially at a time when everybody was, was doing single malts, he created a first, you know, his first blend. So he wasn't afraid to push the boundaries. And I think what we try to do is embody some of that spirit uh, Mm -hmm. when we look at, you know, how we extend our brands today. It's obviously got to be driven by the consumer. It's always got to be driven by what the consumer would like, what they perhaps don't know they would like. Uh, But then also just looking at trying to make our brands a, a, a force for good. So, you know, as an example of that on Guinness, for example, we have, um, a huge association with rugby uh, it's you know yeah. where we you know it's where we're consumed it's you know what we what we sponsor however there was a stat that really surprised me only four percent of media coverage is actually around women's sport which also historically isn't an area that guinness has played in um but then when i talk about you know our brands being a force for good that's really something that we've tried to further in terms of expanding our brand so partnering for example with the likes of wikipedia to look at some key athletes profiles um and to make sure that they are verify that they are you know as strong as some of the male athletes profile just to level the playing field likewise you know on twitter just verifying their 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 profiles there so just really pushing our boundaries there in this in this in the same sense that probably arthur guinness would have done (laughs) you know all that time ago not being afraid and we've obviously got large brands we're looking also always to expand our portfolio so we're, we're purchasing uh, some smaller brands in areas where perhaps we haven't had our strength. We have a huge agenda in uh, low and no alcohol, for example. Yeah. So Seedlip is one of the key acquisitions over the last few years that we're moving into a space that, you know, perhaps as an um, a beverage alcohol company, you wouldn't expect us to, um, t- to make a move in. We're looking to reinvent ourselves. We're looking to disrupt. And I think you need to, you need to do that. If you're building a brand, you, you, you have to be a disruptor and you have to be unafraid to disrupt yourself as well. Let's disrupt things right now with an ad break. And while those are on, take a second to hit your follow button so you don't miss an episode of How to Be a CEO. Back in a sec. You said that you feel like the custodian of a brand. Uh, And clearly you've done your research into the history of these things was that important to you when you you take over something like Guinness I guess does that make you feel like you understand the brand better knowing where it came from absolutely and I think it's so inspiring to hear the stories of 
our founders, whether they be new founders, like for example, George Clooney, you know, with uh, Casamigos and you know, how, how that originated or all those years ago with, uh, with Johnny Walker and, and, and Arthur Guinness. So if I look at myself as custodian, I see myself as essentially the torchbearer for a, mm. for a period of time on that brand. And I want to be true to the brand. I want to reinvent, you know, and I want to think about what, what the people who created those brands would do in this current environment and I think we all are inspired so if I look at you know if I look at our um our agenda and again on Johnny Walker you know we've just built a huge center in uh, Princess Street in in Edinburgh yeah. also where you can my hometown there your you hometown yeah. there you go have you been not yet right <laughs> oh, well. we definitely have to get you along <laughs> it's a brilliant it's a it's a it's a brilliant experience um you know and, and 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 it's a look at the history but also the way forward so I think it's important to be inspired by those things why you know in packaging but then also in the way that we uh, in the way that we create our campaigns and the way that we do business so it's absolutely something that we look to yeah I guess I mean it'd be easy to think of things like Johnny Walker as established as traditional because they've been around for so long but actually they were disruptors so does that give you confidence to innovate and disrupt within that space using those brands because you know this is how it started absolutely so I think you have to you you can never rest on your laurels in terms of you know a, a brand persona we have to make sure that especially for some of those those brands we we're, we're current and we're at the you know we're, we're at the forefront of of society um the guinness example where we've really helped female sports mm. sports people and athletes you know l- leveling their playing field to you know create a more inclusive a more inclusive society i think you know that's the role for some of our brands to um to be the force for good in that and to to constantly look at ourselves to disrupt some of the some of the things that we're doing who we're speaking to how we're being served so again if i look at hosp- london hospitality we've soon we've seen a huge surge in cocktails and actually if you look at some of the challenges that the hospitality industry are facing there are staff shortages um, a lot of the staff aren't you know haven't gotten years and years of training um there's fortunately um, a great number of people who want to have cocktails and pubs but what that means is if I'm behind the bar I'm going to be hard pressed to get a great tasting drink out quickly so one of the things that we've done also working with our customers is to launch a draft cocktail system with absolutely amazing flavors that we've got a passion fruit martini we've got an espresso martini that's my personal favorite (laughs) um, which is which is a draft solution which is easy to serve quick to serve but delivers an absolutely amazing tasting drink it's made with Smirnoff um, and uh, it, it, it helps our customers because it actually answers one of one of their problems but it also obviously delivers a great experience for the consumer so just doing things like that that you know have the consumer at their heart talk to our customers and actually solve a solve a problem for them create great experiences I think that's that's one of the ways and in which we, for example, have disrupted cocktail making because prior to that, you needed a shaker, you needed a jigger, you know, you needed ice, you needed, you know, all of the various paraphernalia and quite a lot of time to actually make a great tasting uh, cocktail like that. Yeah, there's always a big long queue in a cocktail bar. Have you reduced queues in cocktail bars because we can get them out faster now? I would like to think so, <laughs> but I also would like to see the queues quite long for a, you know for a, for for a, for a long period of time. Um, and I think we've seen we've seen a huge surge in cocktail. So and I think one of the things you know, and I've obviously been home during the during the pandemic, and I've enjoyed parts of it a lot. And I've become you know home mixologist in a way, but absolutely I cannot make as great a drink as I can uh, find in the you know in the, in the London on trade and some of the London bars that, that we've got here and just going out and having an experience that I can't recreate in the home you know that really fresh ice cold pint of Guinness or um, you know that well-made cocktail that's garnished that's served to me that's absolutely amazing so you can't replicate that in the home and I, I just you know hope that 
that long may it continue. Do you think just opening this building itself is a symbol? Diage, you're staying, we're not going away, we can help you. Oh, absolutely. It's it's a huge commitment from our part into the capital, you know, because we, we're, we're seeing people come back to the office, we're seeing people, you know, really thrive also in, in you know, wanting to go out, go out uh, for after work drinks more so than we had, you know, even a year ago. So we're seeing people come back and really wanting to foster those connections. I'm a big fan of tech. Um, and I think it's been, you know, absolutely incredible in terms of enabling some of the flexible working. And I truly embrace that. But I think there's something special about sitting down, having a pint of ice cold Guinness and just being authentic. Presumably you're not offering pints of Guinness at every meeting that you have, but are people coming back to this office? Are they excited to return? Yeah. Um, so we, we've had a, quite a few discussions around this, you know, because we were, I think we were all, we've always enabled very flexible working at Diageo and I think we'd become quite used to it. But if you look at the office and how it's built up, it's really built up with our employees at the very heart. So even in, cr in the creation of it, um, employees fed into the process. And if you, you know, take a tour around the office, you can see that there are very many different spaces. So some f spaces for more formal meetings. There are very informal meetings. We've got two world-class bars as well. So <laughs> whilst I'm not going to be able to serve a Guinness at every meeting, it does take, you know, it, do it does take some formality, at, at, you know, out of yeah. out of um, out of the conversation, it's great for that. We've also got you know a hugely attractive offering. Then from a wellness perspective, we've got um, an exercise and fitness room right on the top floor. Uh, we've got uh, you know art around the walls. We've got some 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 living walls here. There's a lot of greenery in the office, and just bringing people together. I think they've really yearned for that connectivity. You know, they just pop to the pub on a Thursday, or they might bring some friends into to some of our bars, um, and and that just gives gives me great energy to you know come into work every day and do what I do. I guess just as one final question, just thinking about you know getting out of the home and going back into bars and restaurants and enjoying the hospitality industry. Do you remember what you did when you came out of lockdown? Do you remember where you went and, and what you do? You remember ordering that pint of Guinness? Let's say it was a pint of Guinness because you worked for Diageo, but can it be anything? Do you remember that and 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 did that feel kind of satisfying? Did it feel relief to you? It, it did, and both obviously on a professional level, but also on a personal level, because just that that connection moment, then I do remember actually going out. It was actually my wedding anniversary <laughs> with my husband, and we went to the pub, and it just gives you, or, or gave me at the time, it gave me really that feeling of being amongst it, of being back in, you know, ba you know back both professionally and, you know, in, in the industry, but also of, um, just being back uh, in in life, being able to resume, you know, my my social life in a way that to me felt more authentic. So, yeah, I definitely remember that moment very well, and I did have a Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> That was Katerina von Frank from Diageo. For more business interviews, news and analysis, check out the Evening Standard newspaper or go to standard.co.uk forward slash business. New episodes of How to Be a CEO drop first thing every Monday morning. We'd love to see you again.